Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Ground Truth track at B-Sides Las Vegas. Uh, please remember to visit our sponsors out in the chill out area because uh, they're awesome and this couldn't happen without them. Uh, without further ado, this is Hiram Anderson. He's a principal data scientist at Endgame. And the alternate title of his talk, which he told me should have been the real title, is Deep Learning Red Teaming. Thanks, give it up. Thanks. Um, we're grateful for, to Ken if you caught the previous talk in this session. It was really good. And um, with apologies to Ken, um, my name is Hiram and I am a data scientist. That's a confession and I do like tomatoes, I guess. So the purpose of my talk today is, is really threefold. And I hope that you'll find at least one of them interesting. Number one is that I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, simplifying and demystifying, hopefully, what is deep learning which is uh, being touted, fairly or not, as one of the key enablers for you know, signature mal malware, malware detection and, and other uh, threat detection technologies. So we're, we're going to bring it down a little bit, simplify that. That's objective number one. Objective number two is that I want to show that, like all defensive technologies, machine learning and, and deep learning um, have vulnerabilities. And actually, what makes deep learning so great for a data science to train with also makes it really convenient to exploit. And so we're going to exploit a bit of our own deep learning models today. And uh, the third thing, the, the, the third takeaway from this talk is that um, what we're actually going to do is build two deep learning models, one of which will we'll exploit. One will take the t place of a blue team, one of the red team, and they'll play an adversarial game against each other. And we'll use this to be able to patch some of the vulnerabilities in our deep learning model. So I've just given you my talk. If you want to leave, you could do that now. But if you want details, stick around for the remaining uh, parts of this talk. So Andrea, if she raised her hand, made me put this slide in. I'm going to spend th 30 seconds on it. My name's Hiram. I'm a, uh, a data scientist at Endgame. I've spent some time in the national labs and at, at other InfoSec companies. Um, and uh, I have research interests. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter. OK. So let me motivate this talk today. Uh, by a, a, not a machine learning thing. We're really going to release a product, and uh, we want to make darn sure that when we release this product to our customers, that it doesn't fall over. So we have one of our, um, our spooky internal red team guys uh, start uh, throwing, in this case, uh, domains at it, and make sure that endgame.com passes through our product successfully, but that um, uh, a, a malicious website, uh, you know, some, some phishing website, Endgame-2016, is properly detected as bad. Um, and then, my goodness, uh, he does find one that should be bad, endgame.com, but our product, uh, product says that, that it's good, and he finds a problem. So, of course, he then takes uh, this feedback to the product's team, and they patch that hole, so that hopefully the product that he releases doesn't have that, that vulnerability. Now, this is no different than what we do, and, and if you caught uh, Ken's talk previously, what we do when we're releasing a machine learning model. Uh, there's, a, there's a similar process of validation where a human is in the loop and is trying to make our model fall over. So uh, replace product with machine learning model, the process is almost identical. This process will never go away. We'll always need our super smart security guy to poke holes, to find holes, and to patch vulnerabilities in our machine learning models. But part of the thesis today is that we can enable and scale by um, giving that human also the extra power of an additional red team model. And the red team model is going to be specifically designed, designed to poke holes in our blue team model. And uh, by poking holes and discovering those, we can go ahead and turn around, patch those holes, and feel safer about releasing our machine learning product to our customers. So that's the 40,000 foot overview, and here, here's the outline. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on uh, introducing some of the concepts behind deep learning, hopefully simplify it a little bit, um, and demystify what can sometimes seem like hocus pocus. Um, I'll, I'll uh, then sort of jump into the meat uh, of the talk today about how to assemble these deep learning components to form this adversarial game that where two models play against each other. And then the, the sort of the application today we're going to be talking about is detecting 
uh, dynamically generated domain names that malware sometimes uses to establish C2 channels called home. So um, without further ado, to talk about deep learning, I'm going to take you back to what deep learning people call shallow learning. So shallow learning goes like this. First, uh, there's, there are three general steps. There's a pre-processing step. There's a feature representation step. And there's a, a modeling step. So the pre-processing step are things like, um, we don't care about www or .com. Let, let's get rid of those. We're, we're going to prepare our data. The feature representation step is all about uh, our, our, our models are good with numbers. And we need to express, in this case, our domain name using numbers. And then our, our predictive modeling step is going to be, how do we use those num numbers to predict on more numbers, more domain names that have been pre-processed and representatures. So in shallow learning, the process is a bit like this. Let's take uh, end game, just the root of our domain, and we'll break it down into a bag of bigrams, ev every uh, consecutive pair of characters. So E N N D D G G A A M E M E. And then we're going to uh, sort of arbitrarily at this point, um, and, and this is kind of the point, figure out a way to express these, these bigrams as numbers. So what we're going to do is uh, express every bigram as a vector, a, a stack of zeros where one bin in that stack of numbers is, is, a, is a one. That one, uh, that, that bin corresponds in the first vector to n, the second to ng, and so on. And then let's, you know, for the sake of being completely arbitrary, we'll, we'll just add those all together to get our, our feature representation, the vector x, which now is a, a bag of these bigrams that represents endgame. So there are problems with this, right? You could, you could um, scramble the letters of endgame a bit and get vectors either very close to or identical to this. But this, this is one way to express uh, endgame. As, as, a, as a bag of numbers that's now suitable to a, to a model. And so um, the, the model that I'm going to just show really briefly today is based a little bit on uh, uh, the linear model that Ken showed in the previous talk. And all it is is this. Essentially, we're going to take this bin of vector and we're going to learn weights for every bin and do a multiply weight by bin, bin value, add them all up, Squash that number between 0 and 1, and you now have a 1 means bad and 0 means good, for example. And this is called logistic regression. And what I've just explained to you is a, can be a really time-consuming process because if I learn a model that doesn't give me the right answers, I'm going to probably blame the way I represented my features, or, or I can blame the model. But there's these kind of two moving parts, three moving parts if I count pre-processing. So this is what we call, uh, well, what deep learning people call shallow learning. I have done this separate step of trying to figure out a way, a convenient way to express end game so that my model can ingest it and then make predictions. So deep learning. Deep learning, all, all it is in a nutshell, is trying to jointly learn both the model and the way that we express things in our model, the way that we re represent them. And it's so-called deep because um, it requires not just sort of this one layer of, of logic, but another layer to express um, how, we, how, how we represent uh, those features. So deep learning, uh, in a nutshell, learning both the features and the model. So uh, if, if, you, if, you could, if you were to spend um, 30 minutes today firing up, uh, deep learning has become, it's, it's becoming commoditized. There are software packages that are excellent that can allow you to assemble uh, deep learning models in, in relatively short order. And um, just as a, as a you know, kind of an anecdote, um, with something like uh, f two hours of coding and 12 hours of training uh, a model, at in-game we produced a hip chat Trump bot that you talk to it and it, it talks back to you in slightly racial overtones. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but the idea here is that the, 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 the big win comes that you spend only a little time developing a model, and data is the key ingredient to making this thing go. And uh, you assemble these things kind of like you'd assemble Legos, or uh, you know, th these would be your resistors and capacitors and transistors of a circuit board. Once you get the basic idea about how they work, you sort of plug them together, and you know, it just kind of works because of the hard work that's been done by a lot of these folks in, in preparing these you know, commoditizing deep learning packages that I'll, I'll explain to you in just a moment. But the first, the first layer, let me just go through these uh, five here because they'll become uh, useful in a moment. 
But the first one I have already described is called logistic regression. I take a, an input vector and I, I add, the, add the, uh, the, the inputs together and I squash it with some squashing function and have an output. The next layer is called a fully connected layer and it's just like a logistic regression layer, but repeated, the output is repeated three times. So there are three different outputs. And this is useful when you want to express, uh, the, to re-express the input as some intermediate representation. And the key here is you don't tell it how to represent. The model learns how to represent based on the task that you're trying to solve, okay? Then the, uh, another useful layer that, that uh, uh, is really popular and you should know about is called the convolutional layer. And it's you know, very much like a connected layer, except uh, where these uh, blue arrows are colored, uh, they all share the same weights. So this gives kind of two things. Um, one is that um, the convolutional layers are good at detecting that there is something, but not where it is. There's a translational invariance. And second is that because there are fewer weights involved, this becomes a really compact model. I don't have to store as much. So that's kind of an implementation issue. So the, the top three layer Legos are all so-called feed forward. They take an input and transform it to an output. And the, the model and the objective learn how to tune those weights, uh, the weights in this case being the edges between the input and output nodes. On the bottom layer, I'm showing just two simple recurrent neural networks where the output is a function of both the input and the output itself. And so this is really interesting because if I, instead of feeding one input vector, if I feed a sequence, so first I feed it A1, B1, C1, and then A2, B2, C2, and then A3, B3, C3 in that sequence, it's going to learn in these output states D and E some kind of you know, state, some notion to capture meaning about the sequence of things plugged in because there's this feedback part of it. And uh, this thing is, looks very complicated. I'll not say much about it, but it turns out that these simple sort of recurrent networks are very hard to train. And uh, there are other mechanisms. And in fact, the, the deep learning folks have, have taken this from computer. So, so they have read and write gates that allow one to train and store information efficiently over a sequence. So that's all I'll say, these are, these are Legos. These are Legos, and once you learn what the Legos do, you can stack them together and, and write, write really small code. So I'm gonna just give a shout out to this package called Keras, which you can write in Python, uh, a deep learning model in about, I don't know, 10 lines of code. And uh, so what you do here is uh, I'm going to define a shallow model first. The, the model will just be uh, an input, so I say model.add, this, this input layer, and I've chosen the, the number of, uh, the number of uh, dimensions with which to express my input. That's called embedding dimension. And then I'll have a single output layer. Again, that's called the logistic regression layer, a single output with, with a sigmoid activation. And that will, uh, that will give me a number between zero and one. So all I have to do now is feed it uh, input data and labels, and it, it will learn by twiddling these weights which ones it should assign to zero and which ones it should assign to one. So this is really easy. If, if we can you know, add the shallow learning with just a few lines of code, we can certainly add, um, we can certainly add another layer. This, this second layer now will have some, nut, uh, some other intermediate representation about, about how to, to express our data. And, and here's the key to deep learning now is internally in game, we actually call this brute force differentiable learning. Because why not add a million layers? Because the software is gonna do its best to try to, uh, try to optimize your, the output you give it for, for the inputs you give it and just learn all these weights. And um, so uh, th this becomes just kind of a, a, an engineering game. You, you try things and, and usually it'll kind of work. And then you flip, or flip some, you know, replace some Legos and it kind of works a little better. And at the end of the day, you, you can build a, a, a hip chat trunk bot. So, um, you know, just uh, incidentally, I think our hip chat Trump bot was, uh, was just about 20 lines of code and, and looked very much like this, and it was really the data that made it, made it work. Okay, so a dirty secret about machine learning and about deep learning is that um, they, have, uh, they, they have vulnerabilities like all defensive products. And there, there, is, there is not a machine learning model unless your data is trivial that will, will not make a mistake. It, it's a fact. In fact, uh, um, one thing that makes deep learning so attractive is that I can 
solve these massive problems and take on these big models because the model is differentiable. And if, if you took high school calculus, remember a chain rule, if you differentiate something you, with respect to a, another function, you, you do this chain rule. And that is all that deep learning is. Solving that is just the chain rule and application. But guess what? Because of calculus, hashtag thank you calculus, we can also exploit uh, deep learning. And it, because machine learning and deep learning have these blind spots, I, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. So just, just for fun, there's a deep learning model, an uh, image credit here, that uh, with 57% confidence believes that image is a panda. Now I'm going to just add the tiniest fraction of noise. Um, if you'll notice, it's, this is what the noise looks like, but it's scaled by seven one thousandths. So it, it would look black to you. you. You wouldn't notice what the additive noise even looked like. And incidentally, if you fed this uh, almost black image that's scaled for visibility, if you fed this to a deep learning model, it would say that's a nematode with 8.2% confidence. And if you add those two together, well, my goodness, now the deep learning model thinks that you have uh, a gibbon, which is not a panda, with 99.3% confidence. So this is a problem. This is a problem for those people trying to tell the difference between pandas and gibbons, obviously. But think about the problem in information security where uh, these kind of images, um, instead of images, we're, we're, working with, we're working against an adversary. So this is an important slide. If you remember nothing else, remember this slide. All machine learning models have blind spots. They have vulnerabilities. Because deep learning is, makes this, these challenging problems simple to solve, it also makes them especially uh, well-suited for exploitation. Um, what, a third thing that we're going to explore in this talk is that if I, and this is kind of scary, if I can find an adversarial example for deep learning, there's a good chance that that adversarial example will also fool a completely different model, be it deep learning or random forest or support vector machine, whatever. There's a good chance that the, these can uh, translate across different machine learning models. So that's a bit scary. That means that the adversary doesn't need your model, he just needs a model, and maybe he can begin to find these. So a key difference, this has been studied in, in academia for the last several years, this notion of adversarial examples. But there's a difference between adversarial examples for an image classifier and adversarial examples in an information security domain. And the key is that if we don't patch it, somebody will find it. Um, very unlikely that this, you know, this picture is going to show up in the wild and an image classifier will you know, make a big mistake calling a uh, panda a gibbon. But in information security, the, the costs are different. We're working against an adversary. So what we're going to do is try to be proactive and discover those vulnerabilities ourselves in our own models and try to patch them. OK, machine learning talk is mostly over. We're going to move on to an application and dive into a little bit of the details about how we construct this adversarial game. So just as a review, the, the application we're talking about today is going to be detecting uh, DGAs. So uh, domain generation algorithms used by malware to call home, um, they, they're really, it's not, not a fair fight because the adversary has to you know, register one out of a million domains but the malware only has to success, successfully connect to one of those, right? So it's really important to find them, or otherwise they'll, they'll establish a C2 channel. So kind of this is how it works. You know, the, um, the, the malware on your laptop and the, the server share a key, and they pseudo-randomly generate a list of domain names one at a time in the same order. And the, the malware will try one, it doesn't exist. He'll try another one, it doesn't exist. And finally, he'll be successful in establishing a connection and be able to call home. What we're going to do in this talk is uh, develop a model that looks only at the domain name and tries to determine whether that has been generated pseudo-randomly or if that is a legitimate you know, human hand-coded domain. So that's, that's the problem. The way we're going to do this, as I alluded to previously, is by setting up this game of red versus blue. So the blue, t the blue team's job, obviously, is to um, take as, uh, as input a domain and try to tell if it's a DGA or not a DGA. The red team's job is 
only one thing, and it's to fool the blue team. Okay, so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have two models, I'm gonna connect them together, and this is again brute force differentiable learning, uh, deep learning, by, uh, by giving it a random seed and saying that uh, what, whatever domain comes out at the output, I wanna call that, I wanna fool the blue team and make it call it good. So that's move number one by the red team, train this generator to randomly generate a domain, an imposter that will check the blue team. Move number two is by the blue team, and it will take that imposter. The, the, the red team ha has served his purpose. He will feed now these imposter samples to the blue team, who will retrain with an augmented data set with these vulnerabilities now exposed, and harden, plug those holes. So that's move two. And we'll do this over and over and over and over again. So um, now I need to tell you that uh, I told you that if you, you know, if you go home tonight and play for a, about a half hour, you can get pretty dangerous at, at creating your own Trump bot or whatever. Um, you can do that. The, these, these more sophisticated net networks are, are, can be hard and uh, hard to train. And so there's some tricks that we employ to try to make the training simpler. And one of those is, a, is what's called an autoencoder. An autoencoder is nothing more than um, a tool in which we input a domain and try to output the same domain. And it's just trying to learn the right representation for all of the domains in our data set so that it can accurately re reproduce it. This is, if you listen to the last talk, this is uh, an example of unsupervised learning where we need no labels, but we can train the weights of our model based on, on just globs of data. So in this case, uh, we will train our, our autoencoder on the Alexa top 10,000 or Alexa top 1 million. And it will learn an efficient way to represent all of these domains in the knobs and dials uh, of deep learning uh, in order to correctly re-express those. After that's done, we have, uh, we have successfully solved a key part of our adversarial problem. Most of the meat of this model is learning how to represent things. Remember, deep learning is about representing things. Once we've solved that problem, we can repurpose our autoencoder and just add these tiny top layers. That the purpose of this top layer is to transform a random seed to that same kind of representation for a domain that was learned. And the purpose of this last layer is to decode a representation and, and classify it as either being pseudo-randomly generated or human generated. So that, that's, a, that's one trick we've, we've used to uh, train our so-called generative adversarial network. Okay, uh, technical deep dive is, is mostly over. I, I wanna show you what I think are kind of curious results from this game of adversarial deep learning. So on, on the uh, left-hand side, I'm showing you the results of the autoencoder. So remember, input a domain name, try to reproduce that same domain name, and it's going to make mistakes because uh, if it didn't make mistakes, we'd be overfitting and have a bad model. So the top here are, are uh, successful examples of our autoencoder representing those domains. So kayak goes to kayak. And the bottom are some, I think, kind of hilarious uh, mistakes that it makes. So input uh, Gillian Anderson and output Gil Gillia Dandelson, which is kind of cool. Looks kind of real, but it's a completely artificial domain. Um, one interesting thing about this, we are in inputting characters and outputting characters. It has no knowledge about, um, about English language. It's learning this all from the data. Okay, on the right-hand side, so this, this was step one. We trained an autoencoder, and then we re-engineered our little network to play an adversarial game. And at the end of that adversarial game, the red team has learned to bypass the blue team. And these are the kinds of domains that it generates that are totally random. So I just want to impress upon you, the input to this was a random seed. And the output is a domain name that says F-I-R-I-A-P-S, which could totally be legitimate if, if one were to look at it. Again, uh, there, there are a lot of, actually one of these, laner.com is actually a registered domain that was generated from just a random number, which is kind of cool. The point of this talk, of course, is not to develop, uh, develop a, a, a DG algorithm, but uh, to harden our classifier. Um, before, I, before I move on to that, I want to compare for a moment what these, uh, these DGA uh, 
domains look like compared to an actual DGA. So here, here's CryptoLocker, right, ransomware, that um, here's the code to generate it, but its domains look like this. And if you were to look at that, you, you could tell right away, you know, sort of fixed length, random, randomly choosing characters, kind of easy for a model to tell. Um, here's another example, the sim to DGA, here's, here's the code to produce it, fixed length, kind of easy to tell. Some of them are clever because they, you know, alternate consonants and vowels, but, um, you know, I think you'd agree that sort of this list is a more compelling list of, of domain names that could fool, fool a classifier. Okay, so in what follows, I'm going to first train not a deep learning model, a totally different model, a random forest model, to detect deep GGA domains. Uh, deep GGA, DGA is what we're calling these, these adversarially generated domains, and only those. So as one job, detect these domains. And you can see, as we play a number of adversarial serial games with our model, its ability to detect these things decreases. Uh, this is a, by the way, this is a rock curve, and it's showing a, the, a trade-off between the false positive and false negative rate. So performance increases as you move to the upper left-hand corner and decreases as you, as you sort of shrink that curve. Another interesting example, so now instead of trying to detect uh, you know, our method and only our method, Let's build a general purpose classifier to detect all DGAs. And, and, my, and you'll see that it can detect almost everything except with a rate of less than half, it detects our things. Okay, so let's, let's flip this on its head now. Uh, the, all of these families, by the way, in this, this uh, plot were equally represented in the trading set. What we're gonna do now is harden our classifier and add a disproportionate amount of these, uh, these samples we've generated to our model to try to harden it. And the results are like this. So before hardening, we can detect um, a family we've never seen with not, not very well, right? Uh, by the way, this, this is an especially difficult example because uh, while we've trained on only characters, character-based DJs, we're trying to detect a DJ based on that, that appends random words together from the, from the uh, dic English dictionary. And we've seen improvement after we've trained adversarial. This is uh, even more stark when we to try our classifier against a method that's like the training data that is based on characters. We see it jump from an 85% detection rate to almost 100%. Okay, so here's my conclusion slide. Number one, all machine learning models have blind spots. And uh, the, the nice thing about deep learning that makes it easy to train, makes it also easy to exploit, and that's the differentiable nature. Um, adversarial examples can be shared across models, and this should scare you just a little bit, that if I find an adversarial example for one model, as I showed you, I, I found it for a, a deep learning model, and it worked pretty well against a random forest model. Number three, uh, we have come up with a way to try to harden these models by playing this adversarial game, and the resulting domains from that game will use to uh, add to our training set. To, to, ro to robustify, to strengthen our model against future attacks and unseen families. Um, the way that you play these games are, are actually really hard problems, and if, if there are any data scientists in the room who'd like to take a deeper, deeper dive, I do have slides I'm not presenting to the general audience because you'd fall asleep, that maybe you'd find interesting about how to, um, you know, how to do some of these tricks. Uh, the one-liner is that you know, instead of you know, instead of trying to find an optimum, we're trying to find this Nash equilibrium in, in a game theoretic setting where there's an equal competition between generator and ejector. So this game theory thing makes it really hard to train. So enough of that. That was actually three lines. I apologize. Last uh, cool applications. We can both generate malicious domains that I think are, are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool, and we can use those domains to harden our models. Um, with that, I, I'd love to take your questions, and uh, thank you for having me here at B-Sides. Hey there. Um, so, um, going back to to the, going back to boy, if I can talk today, going back to each of going back to each of your iteration. 
and layers are they all equally weighted? Uh, the layers, the layers themselves, those, um, do, do you mean the iterations or the layers of the model? Iterations. The iterations, uh, they, we, we generated the same number, they were equally weighted. Yep. Okay, yep. Um, why? Um, that's good, but so in the, in the hardening, we only used the last iteration, like after the game had concluded. Okay. Those were the best, the, the most devious domain names came from okay. the last round. I guess, how do you measure how that last was the best? Um, like this, so um, this, this is a measure about how well Okay. A model can detect those when it wasn't trained on when it was trained on those and only those. So its its ability to catch them uh, decreases as you play this game. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well. Yep. All right. Okay. Thanks. Yep. You bet. All right. Cool. Awesome talk. Um, so you spoke a bit about autoencoders to encode domains into embeddings. Have you tried using them for like uh, other you know contexts like malware or sim logs or anything like that? Yeah. Um, we have we have tried things. So we've tried, I think, many times unsuccessfully, like HTTP headers. Malware's hard because they're there's big in variety, but after featurizing the malware, so representing instead of a sequence of bytes, you know, stripping out PE information for PE files, whatever, th those we can autoencode also to, to some extent. It's a good question. Hey, Hi, Alex. I have a question. Um, if I understood correctly, uh, the, um, there was a very low detection rate on the deep DGA because you're actually withholding the, the training data that would uh, I mean, of the things that were generated by it, right? Um, this so, one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were not, you actually had uh, Deep DGA represented on the training set as well. Deep DGA was in the training set. Okay. The difference between this slide and the previous slide is the classifier is trying to catch all the things, mm -hmm. not just Deep DGA. Mm -hmm. So when but we have a, a, a broad defense, it, it has a hard time. These are the sneakiest one of all of them to mm -hmm. catch. Yeah. Even no, though these uh, yeah. Were the training set. Yeah, I have to look a little bit closer on how you did this generation because yeah, so this is this is if if so it's this is definitely interesting. This is a there are ten thousand samples in every from every family mm -hmm. equally weighted yeah. in this model. Yeah, and because uh, on course. the next slide you uh -huh. were like plus deep DGA, it got me the impression that you had actually withheld the deep DGA oh, yeah. once. The difference here it's a really good question, Alex. Deep DGA is not we're not trying to catch deep DGA. Is not in the test set. Uh huh. So this is how I can catch only this family volatile that was not in the training set, but I've added deep DGA to the training set. Does that make sense? I trained on all all the things all the things plus deep DGA, and that allowed me to catch this family I didn't train on. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. This is so this same is thing here. This is actually a really bad example because yeah. we're still only getting fifty percent. This is a really hard one. This is pretty astounding. It means that you know my my uh, false negative rate goes from 15% to almost zero because I've totally artificially created part of my data set with DDJ, right? So n no work yeah. except I'd, data science salary. Yeah. I'd be very curious. <laughs> yeah, didn't do, you didn't do a thing, right? Uh, I'm very curious to see how this impacted the, the false positive rate. And I see the rock curve, of course, but, uh, but uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is really interesting. I do have one, I'm sorry, I'm hogging the microphone. I just have one more question. Uh, the, especially when you say um, an adversary example would be like, you could generalize it over uh, across different models. Yeah. I mean, assuming that people were doing the lazy thing on deep learning where they don't actually think about the features, they just hot encode it and just feed it to anything else, right? It's, uh, it's the, same, the same principle, right? If someone actually sat down and tried to to create different features and then feed them to, to the thing, yeah. not necessarily they would be. Yeah, so I didn't have time, Alex, but this is kind of interesting, I think you'll appreciate, is that I used real deep learning to generate these things. There's, uh -huh. there's a, it learned the feature representation. The random forest that I'm using to test here was a feature, handcrafted features in the manual sense, which is kind of alarming to me. Yeah. That it turns out that those adversarial examples for deep DGA worked against a handcrafted feature, you know, robust in that sense, uh, random forest model. 
Yeah. Kind of, kind of scary. No, no, no. Yeah, this, this is a. Yeah, I didn't catch that that one as well. Man, it's great work, man. Congratulations. Hey, um, thanks for the awesome talk. Um, so my question is uh, also threefold. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, the first one is that um, what's, what about the false negative rate? Yeah, what, what I've um, it's a good question. So all of these here were. Um, um, we, we only, yeah, the results I've shown, we're only trying to catch bad things, yeah. but false negative rate is a, is a huge problem. And so I, the only graphic I can show you today is this, right? Mm -hmm. So th this is the kind of the representation um, if it's trying to catch DGA, but th there is a false, um, yeah, the, the talk today is not necessarily about that, it's about hardening classifiers. Yep. I don't know right now, but it's a good thing to look into how that might improve maybe the false negative the false negative rate or false positive rate yeah it's a really good question yep so so you know i've been doing this a while ago and so the second question would be um you know that there's some chinese cctld domains uh some chinese domains with .cn uh -huh. um, that uh, really looks like a dga domain but in in fact they're legit <laughs> that's good to know um <laughs> <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, Punicode. Actually, there, there are Punicode in the Alexa Top Windmill that we trained on. Um, I don't have any examples here, but Puni Punicode is hard for our autoencoder to represent. And I imagine that the legit Chinese domains are also hard. But yeah. that, that would be a good thing to look into. Yeah, because it's uh, abbreviations um, of uh, Chinese pinyins. So they really look like, they, they even look like Do a they look DGA like to my bare eyes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. All right, well, that, that'd be a problem. So the third question would be like, um, you said the model is prone, has some vulnerabilities. Um, do, is it getting any better if we use an ensemble model? Oh, what kind of model? En ensemble. Ensemble? Um, yes, but again, ensemble methods have vulnerabilities. So I showed you one. Random forest is an ensemble method. Yeah, exactly. Right? So uh, it, it is prone not just to vulnerabilities, but in fact, some of the same vulnerabilities we discovered for a deep learning model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. You bet. By the way, it's 12.30, so I'm eating up your lunch time. I apologize minimally. Um, so from a vulnerability standpoint, if we think that models have vulnerabilities and we're continuously training um, models to find them and models to um, be protected against them and defended against them, is it going to be like vulnerability assessment where there is always the next vulnerability? And if so, are we, what are we gaining by finding vulnerability in when there will always be vulnerability in plus one? Yeah, um, I, it, it maybe more of a philosophical question because <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't think that anyone believes that there's one tool to catch all the bad things, right? Yeah. And kind of this layered defense is kind of a, back to the previous question, these, this ensemble of ways to catch things. Uh, things will s still get through from time to time, but I think that's the way to go. So um, you harden the things that you have, and you lots of them. Right? And so, yeah. And uh, I guess more a technical question. You're feeding in, ultimately, you were using uh, bigrams uh, to represent the domains? For is that, is that was just the shallow learning. So the, okay. The, what were you using for? A good question. So what we did is we, uh, we allowed the deep learning model to choose a representation in 20 dimensional space for every character. OK. And it, it learned everything else. OK, so, so we, you're feeding the characters in like one by one? Or? Yeah, we feed it an integer that represents a character. OK. Yep. OK. And so, okay, that's fine. Yep, thanks. Gabe, can I dismiss people to lunch? Yes, go. <laughs> <laughs>